Welcome everyone to this special session which focuses on the effects of the recent terrible events in Japan. I'm Fiona Godley, I'm Editor-in-Chief of the BMJ um, and as you all know, uh, 10 days or so ago a terrible earthquake hit parts of Japan and was followed by an equally terrible tsunami um, and if that wasn't enough there was then damage to the Fukushima nuclear plant which is still causing a great deal of anxiety and danger to health. Uh, so this session is really to help us focus on these issues and to learn if we can from them and to give support to our colleagues in Japan and I'm very very honoured to be able to introduce I hope, I will get out of the way, by satellite link, or rather by Skype in fact, myself. Ah, marvellous. We have Professor Shigeatsu Hashimoto from Fukushima Hello. University Hospital on the Hello. far right, far left, sorry, my left, your right. And we have Ryuki Kasai, Professor of Community Health also in Fukushima. Hello Ryuki also an editorial board member. We're very, very honoured to have you with us. Thank you for joining us. And we have in the auditorium at the podium Kazue Nakajima, who is Director of Clinical Quality and Safety at Osaka University Hospital. And we have uh, Katsumasa Ehara, Director of Patient Safety, who was involved in helping survivors of the Kobe earthquake. Uh, that was 16 years ago, with major um, structural damage and 6,000 people killed uh, and um, terrible problems with no availability of water and um, Katsumasa Ehara was involved and continues to be involved in helping survivors of that earthquake and also Etsuko Yamaguchi who is patient safety lead at the City University in Osaka and has been involved in helping survivors of the current tragedy and finally delighted to have with us Emily Friedman who is professor, assistant professor at the School of Public Health in Boston who has a great deal of experience in helping uh, countries rebuild after disasters, especially in Cambodia, and will be talking to us uh, tomorrow or later today um, about her, tomorrow, that her experiences. So, let me first of all hand over to Kazue Nakajima, who is going to give you um, a summary of events and their impact on the people in the affected areas in Japan. Kazue. Hello, I'm Kazue Nakajima from Osaka, west part of Japan. As a Japanese, I deeply appreciate for having this special session during the International Conference Forum. I will show you some earthquake-related slides before speech of two physicians from Fukushima. The massive earthquake and the tsunami hit the Pacific coast of the northeastern part of Japan on March 11th. Many people lost their families and their homes, and many are still missing. Many survivors have been displaced in evacuation centers. They have been suffering from lack of water, food, electricity, fuel, and medicine under cold weather. Furthermore, damage of nuclear power plant in Fukushima has made the situation more complicated. The map shows Fukushima Prefecture in yellow. Immediately after the shock, international aid and rescue teams have been floating into the devastated areas to help the survivors. People around the world have been praying for Japan. Dick Bruder, a Dutch illustrator, has drawn a special illustration of Miffy, the child rabbit, to comfort the children who have been frightened by the earthquake and the tsunami. Japanese healthcare professionals have been working for the survivors and the patients, even though many of them were affected by the earthquake themselves. Today's speakers, Dr. Kasai and Dr. Hashimoto, are Fukushima-based physicians. 
Dr. Kasai is a BMJ editorial board member. He has been blogging about his experience for the BMJ regularly. He's also a professor of the Department of Community and Family Medicine. He's a community doctor. He has been outreaching for the survivors. And Dr. Hashimoto, Director of Patient Safety and Quality of Care Department in Fukushima University Hospital, which is only one university hospital in Fukushima. He has been working for disaster management in his hospital, which no one had ex experienced before. So I will hand over to Dr. Kasai first. Hello, Dr. Kasai. Hello, Kazuya. Hello, everyone. First of all, please let me pray with you for those who lost their lives, their loved ones, their houses, their work, their hometowns, and their hope by this terrible disaster. Thank you so much for inviting us from Fukushima to share with you what we have observed since the 11th of March, when the first earthquake and the tsunami hit us in the Pacific coast area of northeast regions of Japan. According to National Policy, uh, National Police Agency in Tori, as of at 6 a.m. in the morning Japan time today, 12,468 people were killed and uh, 15,091 people were missing. In Fukushima Prefecture, at least 1,158 people were killed, 4,280 are missing, and 45,735 people were still compelled to live in the evacuation shelters. I would like to share with you some lessons. A major lesson from the first two days of the disaster was the need to resume information networks as quickly as possible after the disaster, collaborating with the local and national governments, police, paramedics, telecommunication companies, and the internet services. Normally, I move between three, uh, between five teaching practices in the communities, so which are 220 to 230 kilometers apart one another, to teach 17 GP registrars in the prefecture. But I had to cancel these visits because the transportation systems and the roads are badly damaged. I tried hard to make sure all my trainees and colleagues were safe and sound. However, I was not able to contact them all until five days after the first earthquake hit. It was just difficult for us to get a picture of what was going on in the prefecture overall. Uh, another major lesson from the following two to three days was the need for a good collaboration between specialists in the hospitals and primary care physicians even in the acute disaster field. If many patients with primary care problems had not rushed into secondary tertiary care hospitals after the disaster, the function of the hospital would not have been affected so much. On the other hand, care of the weak, such as frail elderly children, pregnant mothers, nursing mothers, people with chronic illnesses, mental illnesses, or multiple comorbidity can be easily left behind in the acute disaster period without well-functioning primary care providers. Since Japan has a weak system of primary care, it is quite difficult to coordinate sporadic aids by primary care doctors from several other prefectures in Japan. Along with these normal disaster recovery activities, we had to face the third disaster after the earthquake and tsunami, namely the series of hazardous 
accidents at the nuclear power plant located on Pacific Coast in Fukushima Prefecture. The acute disaster period has been followed by the period of uncertainty, especially in Fukushima Prefecture. Despite several trials, operations to cool down the crippled reactors, they still seem active and controllable with radioactive leakage. I believe that the prevention of thyroid cancer of children should be a top priority. But still, um, we don't know, uh, we don't have high quality standardized evidence based information to assist us. We Japanese experienced the disasters in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. But despite this, there are many misunderstandings regarding ionizing radiation. We need information on immediate, short, and long-term effects of radiation, and interventions and the strategies to alleviate the effects. Also, we need to know how better we can give that information to the parents to support them emotionally and to follow up beyond the acute disaster period. As we have many farmers and fishermen in Fukushima, we are very much concerned about risk of a potentially contaminated foods, such as milk, meat, fish, vegetable, rice, buckwheat, sake, and so on, and their economic consequences. Today, I have uh, just come back from the uh, area, which is uh, 20 to 30 kilometers from the nuclear plant, just outside the uh, exclusion area. So we are still Hundreds of uh, elderly people lived. And uh, so the gov government, uh, it seems that the government uh, is planning to uh, compel them to uh, go outside this area. But uh, I don't think uh, it's an uh, easy thing because uh, those people, most of them are bedridden, demented persons. So they, uh, it's just uh, too difficult for them to live without their hometowns, neighbors, families, and so on. Thank you very much. And then now uh, I'd like to uh, hand the mic to uh, Dr. Hashimoto. Thank you, Professor Sakai. Asai. Hello, Professor Nakajima. Hello. Thank you. Thank you for your uh, introduction to us. Slide, please. Would you please start, Dr. Hashimoto? Thank you. Uh, first of all, I express a sincere con condolence for many victims of this dis disaster. I deeply thank all the people around the world giving support and encouragement. And I also thank organizing committee to give us opportunities to present our anti-disaster activities. A huge earthquake of uh, magnitude 9.0 that the Iwate of Ofin was semic center and a massive tsunami struck our country and caused nuclear power plant accident uh, subsequently on 11th March. We have been struggling of, of, with these disasters. Next slide, please. Okay, please. This, is, this uh, slide uh, shows our hospital. Our hospital has uh, 30 clinical departments and 780 beds uh, inland from tsunami affected area. Our buildings have been spared uh, serious damage that has incapacitated other health 
healthcare facilities. No one was injured by the earthquake, but a water and electric supply system of Fukushima City was destroyed and suspended water supply for our hospital. Next slide, please. Uh, okay. Our system, uh, we organized immediately anti-disaster headquarter consisting present director and vice directors of hospital and directors of clinical quality management. Uh, no available information such as uh, number of victims the number of patients we should have received and damage of hospital of the disaster area was provided us municipal government. Therefore, we anti-disaster headquarters gathered ourselves all information outside and inside hospital and university, handled information that we obtained and make it intelligence and perform quick decision making. Next slide please. Uh, this slide shows anti disaster headquarter activities. Uh, next slide please. Uh, we held a meeting for head of all department of our university and affiliated hospital for three times a day, uh, 9, 15, and 21 o'clock. Then the information was held in common with all staff and the head of uh, various department of division reported each specialized problem such as water, uh, food, drug and electric supply, the treatment and the transportation of the patient and atmosphere radioactivity to make uh, to, to the task force of anti-disaster headquarters. Next slide please. Uh, we should have two major operations. Uh, one is treatment of injured patients, and second is uh, response to nuclear plant crisis. Next slide, please. We were operating under severe water and uh, electricity uh, conservation conservation protocol. Uh, Fukushima Medical University has given uh, priority to severe injured patients and those directly affected by the earthquake and aftermath. These patients arrived in buses, uh, ambulance, and medical evacuation helicopters. Fukushima Medical University's doctors heavy air ambulance has been joined by additional helicopter crews operating from university's soccer field. Furthermore, we have supported disaster medical assistance teams, uh, so-called DMATs, uh, from around Japan. Uh, category green, uh, 93 cases uh, walking wounded. Uh, category yellow, uh, 44 cases uh, moderately injured, not immediately life-threatening. Category red, 30 cases, serious injured, life threatening. Uh, category black, one case is mortality. However, the serious cases, case number of, uh, uh, excuse me, however, the number of serious cases was less than expectation, expectation because the damage that tsunami was life threatening. Most of the men swallowed uh, by the by a tsunami were drawn and were not safe. The other hand, the people who expect, escaped from a tsunami was moved by oneself and was able to take refuge. Therefore, they tended to be injured mildly. Next slide, please. The very confused situation occurred in the prefectural office forward after nuclear power plant accident. Malfunction occurred in not only prefectural office but also government of Japan. Next slide please. 
Therefore, we reconstructed collaboration system for anti-disaster operations. We dispatched the doctor team to the prefectural office to gather available information, control of confusion, support and coordinate the prefectural anti-disaster office. We made uh, unification of the communication system between our university and the prefectural anti-disaster office. And we showed on mission uh, dignity. Uh, we demonstrated surprise and staff of government via prefecture anti-disaster office. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is our mission, anti-disaster operation, uh, medication for disaster victims, organizing transportation of refugee patients from the distracted hospitals. Uh, preventive medicine, uh, such as infection, uh, cardiovascular disease, deep pain, thrombosis, psychiatric disorder, EDC for refugee, and uh, anti-nuclear power plant accident, medication for patients with radiation exposure, organizing uh, transportation of refugee patients from the hospital located in radiation exposure area screening radiation exposure of refugee, uh, countermeasure for radiation rumor. Next slide, please. This slide shows a screening of radiation exposure and the transportation and acceptance of refugee patients from hospitals located in the radiation exposure area to our hospital. Next slide, please. Uh, we also contaminated and treat the victims uh, who, who is workers of nuclear power plant exposed, exposed radiation. Next slide, please. Uh, we planned countermeasure for radiation rumor in early stage of this accident. We invited an expert, uh, Professor Yamashita uh, of Nagasaki University, who was famous for epidemiologic studies and the clinical uh, activity about radiation injuries in Chernobyl and gave us intelligence about radiation injuries. As a result, the, our staff was not upset. That's all. Thank you for your attention. Dr. Hashimoto and Dr. Kasai, thank you very much indeed. I'm now going to invite Emily Friedman to um, make a few brief comments. Emily. In studying disasters over the years, everyone needs a hobby. I uh, have come to some conclusions that I have learned from people such as our colleagues in Fukushima. The first is someone has to set the priorities. And whoever sets the priorities has to be able to make them stick. And priorities have to be both short-term food, immediate medical treatment, protection from the weather, and so forth, and long-term, which range from family reunification to care of chronic illness and the effects of trauma. There is also, as my colleague and I were just discussing, coordination of effort. If you saw that, that first slide that our colleagues showed, uh, of what looked like the New York subway system in terms of disaster management. Coordination of effort <clears throat> between government and other entities is essential, but experience also shows us that when you have a catastrophe like this, many non-governmental organizations want to help. There are some that are extremely mm. skilled at it, but when you get a hundred of them coming in, they start tripping all over each other getting in each other's way and actually hindering effort. Someone has to be able to say, in some cases, stay away. And there has to be an identified person or entity to coordinate effort. Also, and I particularly know this from Cambodia, but, and also from New Orleans, 
that the health effects of emotional trauma do not necessarily manifest immediately. People tend to keep a stiff upper lip and sit on it, keep it bottled up. Friends of mine who treat uh, survivors of the Cambodian trauma tell me that they see post-traumatic stress disorder decades after the person suffered the original insult. Long-term monitoring of people who are traumatized by disaster is absolutely essential. That is part of the larger issue that we were also discussing of mental health. <coughs> Please excuse me. When, when something like this happens, the natural tendency is to think in terms of physical health issues and not mental health. But I can tell you from experience, many people who survive initially die later. There are spikes in suicide rates, and it is very common for people to neglect their own physical health. Some of it is simply straight traumatic injury. Some of it is personal loss. Some of it is dislocation of one's life. Particularly for children, it's the trauma of having seen things people should not have to see. And sometimes it's survivor's guilt. And many people are reluctant to speak about it. What has proven very helpful, even if there is a shortage of clinical professionals, is support groups, peer support groups, which can be fairly easily organized and can be self-run. As we were also discussing, and this tragedy is a perfect instance, the important thing is to get people the services they need. And sometimes you have to say, forget the paperwork. People whose house is now floating somewhere in the Pacific Ocean cannot produce a birth certificate. They can't produce proof of insurance. Sometimes they don't have an address anymore. The most important thing is to get them the services that they need because even while you are dealing with the catastrophe, and this is extremely important, life goes on. While you are dealing with the immediate traumas, people are getting born, people are dying, people need dialysis, people need antihypertensives, people need their anti-diabetic medicine. And those people can end up just as dead as people who died in the quake if we don't understand that there are underlying health care needs in the area that are going to keep happening as they happen every day. And finally, and this is particularly for our colleagues in Fukushima, those who risk their lives to care for others have to be cared for themselves. In Calamity after calamity that I have studied, healthcare workers particularly will work until they drop. They keep saying, I'm fine, I'm good, yes, I can stay up another 24 hours. And then they just fall over, and a lot of them get sick. There are obviously dangers that our colleagues in Japan are facing that are even worse than that. But whether it's the people who dug survivors out of the rubble in Haiti when something could have fallen on them at any time, the physicians and nurses who care for people with potentially fatal infectious disease that often occurs after a disaster, or our colleagues who have just shared their experiences with us. These are heroes by any standard. The last person to die after the bombing of a federal building in Oklahoma City in my country in 1995 was a nurse named Rebecca Anderson who ran to the scene to help. She didn't have to. She was the last person to die. A piece of rubble fell on her and killed her. And she came to consciousness long enough to donate her organs and then died. We have to remember that many of these people themselves are going to be suffering emotional trauma, exhaustion, exposure to great health dangers. And we have to remember to take care of them down the line. And I would also add for Dr. Kasai and Dr. Hashimoto that we should celebrate these remarkable people and we should be grateful that they are among us. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Emily, for those very good words. Um, so Ryuki and Shigetsu, uh, well, there are many people who've asked, what can we do to help? I mean, it, it, it seems hopeless for us to be helpful from here, from Amsterdam, or really from anywhere in the world, but I know that Japan has received international help. Can you give us a sense of what has been the most helpful um, interventions and what more you think um, needs to be done or can be done? Oh, thank you so much uh, for this session and for your comments. And uh, 
I think most, uh, uh, yeah, the thing uh, we need is uh, encouragement from uh, your heart. And uh, the fact uh, someone is uh, thinking of us in Japan is very nice. And uh, as Emery said, uh, my trainees, uh, the whiskey, so they uh, were very much uh, exhausted and that they worked too hard. But uh, if I, and when I gave them a message from uh, your, uh, from the world, and that they are uh, very concerned, and uh, they uh, uh, they have thoughts. Uh, um, they have us in uh, their thoughts. So that fact uh, uh, are very easing my trainees, and then uh, encourage them to work uh, the next day. So. Uh, uh, so this uh, uh, the human network around the world is a very uh, good thing for us. Thank you very much. Thank you. And um, Dr. Hashimoto, your thoughts on what can be done, what we can do to help? I also think uh, encouragement from the all over the world. And one example, uh, YouTube uh, on broadcasting uh, Pray for Japan. Uh, our uh, employees are very encouraged that uh, broadcasting. And then they are work uh, more hard. And uh, we can continue our activities. So uh, encouragement of human or humanity is very important in these uh, phases. And also, we act for many victims uh, continuously. And our most uh, problem uh, or aim is uh, a save, to save children from the radiation uh, damage. Thank you. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Hashimoto and Professor Kasai. I'm sure that all of the people here and those who are watching from around the world send you their hope and continued support. And we will be keeping, um, hoping to keep in touch with you over the next few weeks and sending our very best wishes. Thank you very much indeed. And thank you also to our guests on stage and thank you all for being here. Uh, please enjoy your lunch and do what you can in terms of sharing your hopes for the future for Japan. Thank you.